In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. I was asked today to speak about uh, what is the church exactly. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak with you. Um, and this, for this service, I miss you all very dearly and uh, hope you're all doing very well. So there's no better time than today to really discuss what the meaning of the word church is and what the church is um, on this blessed feast of Pentecost, I wish you all a blessed feast. And we know that the feast of the Pentecost is known as the birth of the church. On this day, um, we know that the presence of the Holy Spirit, a permanent presence of the Holy Spirit within the church, began this church and the works of the church. And from that day forward uh, was the birth of the church. So no better, no better time and, and day to speak about this uh, meaning of the word church itself. Also, as you all know, we're all going through this same uh, difficult time with COVID, and we're all missing the church uh, very, very much. Uh, now that it's partially open, but for the longest time, it was completely closed. And, you know, it really hit us hard seeing that the church, as we know it, is closed. But it kind of brings back to the, the point of, of, of this talk is what exactly is the church? Uh, we know the church building was closed, but hopefully uh, we were able to see past that and make the best of, uh, of, of use of this time. We'll get into that more as we go on. So if we look at the word church in itself, and we go to the dictionary, we see different definitions of the dictionary, in, uh, of the church in the dictionary. The most obvious definition we see here is the one that we know the most and most people refer to as the church, is a building for public and Christian worship. This is, of course, the, the church that we're missing now. Uh, that's only partially opened. That's only one definition of the church. To go further in the dictionary, we see another definition of it is a body or organization of religious believers. Um, let's see here, the, uh, the whole body of Christians. So the Christian church as a whole, regardless of the building, you know, with or without the building, is referred to as the church. Um, you can also see a congregation like the Church of St. Mark, the Church of uh, St. Peter of Prolos. These are referred to as the church Again, outside and separate from the church uh, building. Going to the Greek word for church, it's ecclesia or ecclesia in Coptic. We see further that it means an assembly or a congregation. Again, nothing that has to do with a building. The church itself is an assembly, a congregation, or you could say an organization. And I'll take it even a step further and say a living organization or an organism. And we'll get into that more in, in a little bit. Just looking at a couple synonyms in the Dictionary of the word church, we see two specifically that I want to point out, uh, tabernacle and temple. And these will become important, especially given the, the Feast of Pentecost. So let's go to the first meaning um, of, the, of the word church, the one, of course, that we're all missing very much right now. And this is the church as a building. A lot of us, when we hear the word church, we immediately think of, oh, what, what church are you referring to? Then? Which church building? Um, just want to go back in time in history just for a little bit. In the early days, the Christians continued to attend daily services actually in the Jewish temple and the synagogues. We know that the current church building, which I'm not going to discuss much today, but it's built um, to resemble the, the original Jewish temple. Um, we see in re reference in Acts, St. Peter, St. Peter and St. Paul and uh, Peter and John both went to the temple to participate in the prayers. Of course, gradually, as the differences uh, got stronger, the Christians gradually were expelled by the Jews from the temple. And we know later that the temple was destroyed uh, by the Romans in 70 AD. And all that's left of it now is this uh, wailing wall here that uh, Jewish pilgrims can go and visit. So after the, they left the temple and the synagogues, we see that actually, ironically, the early church buildings were actually in people's homes. So now we're stuck in our homes uh, during this, this quarantine time and the past few months. Ironically, that's where the early Christians began to have um, liturgical services and um, what, what we know now as, as a church building was in their homes, specifically either the upper rooms or, or even entire homes. We see um, that meetings and the breaking of bread, which we know, of course, refers to the Eucharist, was occurring in people's homes. Specifically, the mystical supper, we know, the Last Supper, occurred in the upper room of St. Mark's house. 
And uh, also even today's feast, uh, the Feast of Pentecost, we see in Acts uh, referring to the Holy Spirit filled the whole house, referring to the to that upper room that they were gathered in. So these early homes, these early churches were actually in people's homes, um, which brings us back to kind of where we are now in, in our houses. Uh, we see more reference to that in, uh, in Acts. So continually daily with one accord and breaking bread from house to house. They were basically in each other's homes um, and making their homes into churches. Uh, St. Paul also in Romans and also 1 Corinthians discusses the church that is in their house. And they're even having congregations or, or going to the uh, another definition of the church where they were having contentions among among each other and, and disagreements that were already occurring in St. Paul saying in 1 Corinthians, my brethren, those of Chloe's household, uh, I hear that there are contentions among you. So we see kind of the, the early uh, churches were held in people's houses. Later on, of course, churches began to be constructed, second and third century. We get references of constructed churches. The believers had multiplied too large for homes and exist to kind of uh, the building of the church itself. St. Clement of Alexandria and Oregon both referenced consecrated uh, church buildings. Today we'll see in the Orthodox Church three main shapes of the, uh, the church building itself. Uh, one of the least common is just a simple circle, uh, a symbol of eternity, uh, no beginning, no end, everlasting life, such as this one here, St. George in, the, in Old Cairo. Uh, some churches also are built in the form of a cross. Of course, we all miss the major thing of the church building. We know it's, it's, it's major importance in terms of the majority of sacraments occur in the church. We're all missing the Eucharist very much. Um, so what better symbol than a cross to design the church? Uh, the, sal the sign of the salvation of human race, and, and through these sacraments, we know that, that we are saved. Um, and probably the most common, which I'll discuss on the next slide, is the uh, shape of, a, of an arc. Even this one here, you'll see, it, even though it has a cross, a lot of times it'll be an arc or a ship uh, with, a, with a cross somehow um, in, in, that, uh, in that design. And why exactly an arc? If we remember the story of, of Noah's Ark, of course, eight of them were saved. Uh, through the flood in that ark. And as St. Peter writes here, there's now baptism um, that we're, we're saved through. Again, with water, we're saved. Um, and that, of course, occurs in the, in the church building. So we use this ark referencing that the church itself saves us from the floods of this world, the tribulations of this world. And also, of course, we're saved through the baptism. Um, and you'll see here, the churches have the steeple with the cross on it. Uh, representing the, the mast of a ship, and kind of guiding us through the world, guiding us through the storms of the world as it does through the ship, and also calling all to that symbol of the, of the cross, which is uh, on, on top of that steeple. And some churches go even further with this one. You can see almost design of waves, this church in California, and they put here the oars of a ship or the paddles, as you can see referenced here in the, uh, the ship picture, kind of that the church is guiding us again through the storms and tribulations and, and waves of this world. Um, as St. John, as Christ says in the Gospel of St. John, in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. We all know that the church that we love so much, the building, is the house of God. That's why we, we love to be there. We feel like we feel his presence in it. And even the sanctuary itself um, is, is the holy of holies of the original temple. It feels um, no place more more close to heaven than being in the sanctuary or being in the house, the house of God in general in the church. We love being in that, in that enclosure. St. Paul to Timothy writes, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, going further, the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. St. Cyprian of Carthage goes further with this, uh, this church and this, this house saying, if you don't have, no one can have God for his father who does not have the church as his mother. And outside the church, there is no salvation. And then reference to that house of God and that, that enclosure that we have that, that we feel so, so safe in and so protected in and, and the presence of, of Christ in. St. John Chrysostom says, the church is an enclosure. If you are within this enclosure, the wolf, Satan, obviously does not enter. But if you leave, the beast will seize you. So, of course, this church building, it, 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 there's nothing um, more important to this. And, and by no means am I... Um, undermining the importance of the church building, but it brings us back to where we're at now. Um, the churches were closed, now they're only partially opened. 
um, we're kind of stuck in our home. So what do we do? You know, does that mean we're, we're, we're out of luck? Um, and I, I hope this time we used it to look at the, the other meanings of the church. So again, I like this, this comic here. The building is closed, but the church is open. And it brings us kind of to our next uh, meaning of, the, of the, what the church is. And that the church is as a body. Church as a body. Go well, back to the dictionary definition. We saw that they mentioned that it can mean a body of Christians or a congregation. Again, that Greek word ecclesia, um, an assembly or congregation. We can take that even further and, and say an organization or even a living organization, almost an organism that with or without the, the church building, whether it's open or closed, we still have the church as a body, the body of Christians, the Coptic Orthodox Church as a, as a body, the Orthodox Church as a body, um, an individual congregation as a body. We are, we are one body. And you can see this in Acts when they're talking about how the church was going. They're not referring to a building here, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. He's referring to the body of the church, this congregation of Christians. And again, reference to this word, the assembly, ecclesia, not forsaking the assembling, St. Paul says in Hebrews, of ourselves together as is the manner of some. We we'll even see in the litany of the assemblies uh, that we pray in the, in the liturgy, the, the, the priest will say, pray for this holy church and for our assembly, separating uh, the meaning from the church building as from the, this, assembly, this assembly or this congregation, this body. I'm going to take this a little bit further. If we look even, even more so in the writings of St. Paul, he says, I now rejoice in my sufferings for you for the sake of his body, which is the church. So now we don't only have this group of us, of all Christians, of all Coptic Orthodox Christians, of all Orthodox Christians, um, we're of a, of a specific church, if you will. Um, not only do we have this, this, this body or this assembly or congregation, but we know that this living organism is actually the body of Christ. He again says St. Paul in Ephesians, um, showing how this body functions. We know the body has different parts, right? Your hands, your arms, that all of us work together to form this body of Christ. He gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So all of us, um, in, in every different way, each of us as a servant, in one way or another, each of us has a gift. Each of us has a role in this body of Christ, in this church. Um, each of us makes up uh, part of this unity of faith that, that he says here, um, making up this body of Christ. It's not a church. Um, even if you have the building, it's not a church without this living body of Christ that all of us uh, give part to. There's no better time to talk about service and servants well are we are all servants i don't like hearing you know if someone says well i don't feel like i'm a servant and he's not a servant this is for the servants isn't that we're all servants we all have a different role and hopefully we're using this time uh, to pray to christ if we're if we don't know what that role is ask him to show it to you speak to your spiritual father your father confessing confession that you may you may find your role in the church it's it's not a it's not a thing where we observe as a we heard in the, in the, the talk that Dr. Minazaki gave about the liturgy that without this living body of Christ and all of us giving into it in, in some way, without this work, the work of the people, work for the people, liturgy can't occur. So really the church building in itself is almost nothing without the body of Christ functioning in it and it being a living organism. St. Clement of Rome, one of the uh, apostolic fathers says, I do not, however, Suppose you are ignorant that the living church is the body of Christ, a living organism, whether the building is open or closed, we are still a church in the body of Christ. We look also further. Um, I love anatomy and orthopedic anatomy specifically. This one kind of, of um, rings a bell with me a lot, but you, you see here that not only is it a body of Christ, he kind of goes even further and shows that each of us makes up a different part of the body, a different joint. The whole body joined and knit together, St. Paul says, by what every joint supplies. Each of us has a specific um, supply to this for the edification and the growth of the church. He says here, every part does it share, causes the growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. So again, this church is the body of Christ, and at its head is Christ himself. 
It says you're the head of the body, the church is Christ. This mystery is amazing too. It goes beyond just what we're seeing here as yeah, symbolic, that's great, Christ is the head and we're the body, that's all nice and all. Um, but it's not just a, a, a symbolism. It's actually a mystery in itself. The late uh, Professor uh, Jonas Carmeris, one of the um, recent Greek Orthodox theologians, says, in its essence, the church is a living, divine human organism in which Christ, the God-man, is united with all in precisely the same way that the divine and human natures of Christ are united. So we know that in Christ is a divine and human nature that are in union without separation, without confusion. He's saying that in the same way, we, as the body of Christ, as the church, are in unity with Christ um, in that same way. And if we pay attention in the readings of the uh, sacrament of matrimony, the wedding service, we'll see when we read the Pauline epistle to the Ephesians, most of us are kind of focused on um, the instructions to the husbands and probably even more so the instructions um, to the wife and kind of getting stuck on that. And we know that the, the two become one flesh, referring to the, the bride and groom. But if you read even closer, if you haven't noticed, he throws in here, St. Paul throws in here, that not only is the man, uh, the, the groom and the bride become one flesh through the marriage, but he keeps going back to that it basically resembles how the church, the body of Christ, is in unity with, with Christ himself. So Christ being the groom and the church being the bride, that there's a unity. We see here, again, reference to Christ as the head of the church. He goes on to talk about husbands, love your wives, and then back to the church. As Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her, the church again, to himself a glorious church, not having any spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. And referring back to the church again, for we are members of his body, of his flesh and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So he's referring to the, the groom and the bride in the, in the wedding um, sacrament. And then again, he says, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So just as the man and woman become one flesh through the sacrament of matrimony, Christ and the church, as the professor had said in the last slide, are in, in unity uh, together. St. John Chrysostom, again, reference to this, this groom and bride relationship between Christ and the church, for Christ is spoused for himself as a wife, the church. He loves he provides for her, he guards her, he fences all around her like a garden and cherishes her like a part of his own body. And again, Christ as the head provides for her. As a root, he causes her to grow. As a shepherd, he feeds her. As a bridegroom, he weds her. As a sheep, he is sacrificed. And as a husband, he provides for her. So again, church building is closed. The church is still a living organism, well and alive, um, in complete unity uh, with Christ. But... This is extremely important, especially during this time, as many of our members are suffering, maybe laid off, furloughed, um, sick, difficult times. Um, it's a great time to remember that not only do we all kind of make up this body in our own service and we're all part of it um, in so many different ways, but this is important where St. Paul says here that we have diversities and spiritual differences of ministries and different gifts. Each one has been given to him. And, and he says here, the spirit is given to each one for profit of all. Again, back to the reference to Pentecost and the Holy Spirit in each of us, giving us each different gifts that we should put forth into this body of Christ, that it has many members, all being one body, uh, being many as uh, the body, so also is Christ. Uh, goes on to say here, but there should be no schism in the body, that the members should have the same care for one another. And this is the part I want to make a point here. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. So again, church building is closed. The church is still a living organ organism, well and alive, regardless of the building being closed or open. And here's important, that if one member of us, if your foot's down, your ankle's down, for example, same thing with the members of the church. If one of our members is suffering, um, the whole building, the whole body of Christ suffers. So let's think about those that are in need right now. Ask about those that are far away, far from the church. Those who have no one to ask about them. Um, great time to give to the poor, uh, to focus on uh, finding out what, what we what our role is in the body of Christ itself. We know that St. Paul says in Ephesians, 
uh, reading the, the first hour of the uh, Bea, the prayer book of the hours, prayer book of the hours, having one body and one spirit. Again, going back to that church. We look at the early church, um, going back to Acts, it says, Now all who believed were together, and all had all things in common, sold their possessions and good, and divided them among them um, as, as any had need. Basically, they kind of pulled everything together. They're much smaller, obviously, back then, but they pulled everything together and divided each. They were all equally um, treated, took care of each other, making sure that body was strengthened to edify that body of Christ. There were no divisions, perfectly joined together in the same mind, as St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians. And then St. Peter also says, Above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, again, back to that Holy Spirit, uh, the gifts of the, the Holy Spirit from the Pentecost, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. We all have a gift and we all have something to give back to this body of Christ. There's many of us around us that are suffering and, and need help. Um, and as one member suffers, the whole body of Christ suffers. And we know that when we do good to those around us and we help others, it is as if we did it to Christ. As Christ says in the Gospel of St. Matthew, I'm sure they say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Uh, there's a saying, one of the fathers, uh, by John the Short, the, the dwarf, in referring to this, this body of Christ and in building a house, he says, a house is not built at the top. You don't start with a roof and then work downward. You start with the foundation. And I ask him, what do you mean? What's, what's this foundation that you build up? Um, the house of the body of Christ. This is the foundation is our neighbor whom we must win. Uh, that is the place to begin. All the commandments of Christ depend, depend on this one. All of us join together, helping each other, uh, using our gifts to build this body of Christ, to be part of this living organ organism that's in unity with Christ as Christ is the head. So again, the building is closed, but the church is definitely open. And then it faces to the next church because none of this can, can happen without beginning inside my own house, inside our house. So that's the third meaning we're going to discuss the church in each of our own homes. So definitely over the past uh, few months, few weeks, we've all been stuck in our home and quarantined, um, especially during Holy Week. We've definitely made great use of our prayer corner. We know that the church fathers and our spiritual fathers and fathers of confession recommend that we have a prayer corner in the house, a corner that we use um, to do our, our the, the hours, our family prayers, our alone prayers, some of our readings, and this and that. We see very ornate ones like this one here. Some get very uh, creative, and some even go all the way up to the ceiling. Uh, very beautiful things here to have this prayer corner. It's a very important part of the church and our house. But that's not what I'm actually talking about. It's definitely an important part, but it's only a very small part of the more important thing of having Christ truly in my house. Do we really have Christ in our house? Is this prayer corner being used? And I speak to myself first, is it collecting dust of the books all dusty on there and not being used? We have it as, as show. Or do we actually make use of it? Um, and more important than that, do we actually have Christ in our house? Is our house a little church, which we're going to talk about. And that takes us back again to this the Greek origin, ecclesia, this assembly in our house, husband and wife, uh, with children, without children. We have a church household. And that's where it all starts, the congregation in your own family, in your own house, and that church in our house. And again, if we go back to the reading from the uh, wedding ceremony, Ephesians, Christ is the head of that church in our house. He's the head of this house. So St. John writes wonderful things about uh, marriage and about having this, this church in our house. He writes here, seek the things of God and those of man will follow with great ease. If we regulate our households in this way, we'll also be fit to oversee the church. For indeed, the household is a little church. So each of our houses is a small church. Therefore, he says here, this is amazing. It is impossible for us to surpass, it is possible, excuse me, for us to surpass all others. This would include monastics by becoming good husbands and wives. He's almost saying here that a, a good household, a household that truly has Christ, can almost surpass monastics. 
We know that King David the prophet says here, unless the Lord builds a house, the labor in vain who build it. So truly, unless we invite Christ into our homes and have Christ in our home, our household is not going to be disclosure. This is where it begins before we even think about being part of a living organism of the body of Christ. St. John Chrysostom takes it further and talks about four things that we need to have a church in our house. He says, number one, scriptures, reading of the scriptures, Bible, prayers, spiritual discussions, and then service. So he says, let us make them from the earliest age apply themselves to the reading of the scriptures. Are we spending time um, reading the Bible every day, individually and with our families? Are we discussing it? He says also, just like we come home from work and we lay out, we have a meal ready or something planned, what are we, we going to eat today? Um, also prepare daily, specific times, specific schedules, a spiritual meal. Again, that that household might become a church. And he goes on to say that by doing so, the devil is driven off. That evil spirit, the enemy of our salvation, takes to flight. The grace of the Holy Spirit would rest there instead, and all peace and harmony would surround the inhabitants. St. John goes on to say about prayers. Bend your knees. So we talked already about spiritual discussions and reading the scriptures. Not to prayers. Bend your knees. Send forth groans. Beseech your master to be merciful. He is moved by prayers in the night. Let your house, let the house be a church. Again, where two or three, he says, are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. So through the prayers, through the gathering in our house, our husband and wife, with the children, without children, we pray together, read scriptures together, and Christ truly is in our midst. He takes that even further, saying where Christ is, angels must be there, and archangels, and the heavenly beings, heavenly powers. So you are not alone, seeing you have him who is Lord of all. Let your house altogether become a church through the night. So basically, just like we say, we go to the church, we feel the presence of the angels and archangels and the saints in the church with us. And we hear many stories uh, of, of people seeing them physically in the church. Same thing with our household. Not only do we have Christ in our midst, he brings with him the heavenly beings and the powers with us in the church. Um, it's such, such a wonderful thing that St. John Chrysostom says. Again, St. John, let us, St. John Chrysostom, let us lend going to the giving and the service as our individual households. Let us lend Christ our riches that we may receive pardon of our sins. Let us not neglect him when he is hungry that he may ever feed us there. And it goes back to that verse from the Gospel of St. Matthew. When we feed the poor and give to the poor as our own individual houses, if we you know, volunteer together in soup kitchens and, and, and do things for, for those in need, asking about other, other families and people in need, um, we're doing this to Christ feeding him when he is hungry. St. John again says, make your house a church, your little alms box a treasury, become a guardian of sacred wealth, a self-ordained steward of the poor. You have a defense against the devil, you give wings to your prayer, you make your house holy. So by giving and by treating the poor and, and, and taking care of them, we have a defense against the devil and we give wings to, to our prayer and make our house holy through this, this last aspect of making your house church. So scriptures, spiritual discussions, Prayers, of course, and, and, and service uh, in so many different ways. I know that Abuna says in the, in the liturgy and also when he's praying in the house, um, as well in the house blessing, prayers, he says, houses of prayer, houses of purity, houses of blessings, grant them to us, O Lord, and to your servants who will come after us. So let us do these things so we truly have these houses of prayer, houses of purity, and houses of blessings. The Gospel of St. Matthew, we see Christ says that, therefore, whoever hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like the wise, the wise man who built his house on the rock. The rock, of course, being Christ. If we have Christ as the foundation of our house, building upon it um, in this way through, the, as St. John the Short had said, uh, in, in giving and asking about our neighbors in prayer and scriptures and spiritual discussions, we truly build this, this house on the foundation of Christ and as he's knocking the door, we're allowing him in our midst to go to the church. And now to the last meaning of the, of the church that we have here is if your church is closed individually, each of us can become the church. <clears throat> so again, it kind of all originates in this before even the family church, before the body of Christ as a congregation, and before even the church building itself is the church in each of us. 
And that takes us back to the synonyms we talked about in the beginning, the church synonyms being tabernacle and temple. And of course, as I'm getting to, is Pentecost. That each of us has in us the altar of our heart and the Holy Spirit in the same. Uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians, we do not know that the temple, that your body, excuse me, is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own. So each of us, and inside of us, has a temple, a church, if you will, um, having the Holy Spirit in us. This Holy Spirit is crying out to the Father and, and calling us to prayer, calling us to have a unity with Christ. As St. John says in Romans, you received the Spirit in the Pentecost of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Each of us, through baptism and chrismation, has received this Holy Spirit, which was given back in the day of the Pentecost. And we need to enlighten this fire within us and, and grow in that in that Holy Spirit in our in our prayers and our service and everything individually in an individual church in ourselves. And again, he says in Galatians, and because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of a son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. So it's yearning in us. Um, so let us let us kindle that fire of the Holy Spirit within us and, and, and grow in that. St. John Chrysostom again says, find Jesus at the door of your heart and you'll discover paradise. Again, referring to that church within us, that temple of the Holy Spirit in each of us. And you're going to see starting tomorrow with the, uh, the fast of the apostles, um, during the prayer of the fraction, Abuna is going to say the words, uh, a chosen race, a kingdom, a priesthood, a holy nation, and a justified people. He's referring not only to the apostles who are then going off into service at that time after the Pentecost and, um, and growing the church of Christ, but he's referring to each and, each and every one of us. We read here in the epistle of St. Peter, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious that you as living stones are being built up a spiritual house of holy priesthood. What kind of priesthood? Those that offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Again, that you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special, his own special people. Each of us being the temple of the Holy Spirit, being a house of God in us, in a church, each of us is called to this royal priesthood. So you can almost think of each of us individually is a priest of our own church inside of us, our own temple, our own house of God. So on your, the altar of your heart, you offer sacrifices as this spiritual priesthood. So let's talk about this spiritual, uh, this royal priesthood or spiritual priesthood briefly. So again, we know that he's not referring to the priesthood of the clergy. We of course know that the priesthood is reserved for the clergy only. If this spiritual priesthood that St. Peter is talking about and that we, we hear in the, the um, fraction prayer, of the Apostles' Fast is the spiritual priesthood, the spiritual priesthood of the laity or the people. If we look back in the Old Testament, we know that the priesthood in general had two main duties. One is offering intercessions, and the second is offering sacrifices. So both of us, or all of us, I mean, are priests in, in Christ doing these two roles. So let's first start with intercessions. We know, as you can see in this church here, and we talked about the church being a congregation of saints and archangels and angels offering intercessions and prayers for us. But we individually also have that same duty to pray for one another and offer intercessions for one another, prayers for one another. Moreover, as for me, you see in the Old Testament, far be it for me that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. Each of us is called to pray for you. Again, bringing us back to the second meaning, the body of Christ, that unity. We're all asked to pray for one another um, to edify the church. But it starts with, with us individually um, as part of this royal priesthood. And St. Paul says, praying always um, in supplication and spirit, being watchful for all the saints and for me. So we're called to pray for one another as this first uh, role of this spiritual priesthood. Now, how do we offer sacrifices? We know, of course, uh, the clergy offer sacrifices of bread and wine during the, the liturgy of the Eucharist, um, which becomes obviously the holy body and, and precious blood of Christ. It's not the sacrifice I'm referring to. And here, as St. Paul says, 1 Corinthians, we're asked to offer spiritual sacrifices. I affirm by the boasting in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, that I die daily. Our sacrifice is sacrificing ourselves, our own passions, our own wants, our own needs, um, for those of the spirit, of the, the spiritual aspect, to grow that aspect of each one of us, and also in, in, in dying 
or Christ and in dying to serve others. And, and St. Paul says in Galatians, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So sacrificing ourselves so that Christ may live in us, crucifying our own passions and our own desires that Christ may uh, take part in us and, and, and strengthen that church within each one of us. King David also says that sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, these are God, you will not despise. So separate from the sacrifice of the Old Testament's uh, calves and bulls that he refers to, here he's talking about the sacrifices of each one of us is a broken spirit, a humble and contrite heart, uh, one who, who truly is, is like we see in, in, in the image, throwing ourselves to the ground and putting ourselves, uh, crucifying ourselves so that Christ may grow within us. So no better time during this uh, Apostles' Fast that starts tomorrow than our sacrifices of fasting, prayers, dying to the body, crucifying the desires, the selfishness, asking about others, again, back to growing that body of Christ, the, the, the church, having a repentant and contrite heart. These are the ways that we offer sacrifices in part of this spiritual uh, priesthood and intercessions. Again, St. John Chrysostom says about this priesthood of the laity, he actually says something amazing here. Consider to whom you are giving drink and tremble. Consider you have become a priest of Christ. So as the priest we know gives the, the, the body and blood of Christ, us by giving with your own hand, not Christ's flesh but bread, and not his blood but a cup of water to the poor, for example, we basically have become a priest of Christ. He says also, referring, comparing the altar to the poor man, he says the altar in the church is but a stone by nature. It only becomes holy because it receives Christ's body. But that one, referring to the poor man, is holy because it is itself Christ's body. So almost the poor man is already being in the, in the image of Christ, is Christ's body. As he said, you know, if you do it the least of these, you do it unto me. This person's made in the image uh, of Christ and is itself Christ's body. He's almost more holy than the altar. So this beside you, the layman, that poor man, stand is more awesome than that, more awesome than the altar itself. So this priesthood of, of the laity is real. Um, and he's, he's showing us here how to offer uh, intercessions and sacrifices as that priesthood of the people. It's real priesthood. Your benevolent St. John Chrysostom says, gives you this priesthood. Your giving, the treating of the poor gives you this priesthood. So I'd like just to conclude here. Um, one of the Psalms we read as we're going to the church building says, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. So truly we're all, you know, really yearning for the church doors to open fully and all of us, everything to go back to normal. <clears throat> but hopefully during this time, we realized um, more so than ever, the other meanings of the church, um, that it starts within the church and each one of us individually. Um, that the, even though the church building is closed, it's open in so many ways. And each of us, we know in the Feast of Pentecost, each of us has become in ourselves an individual church, a temple of the Holy Spirit, called to this royal priesthood uh, to offer spiritual sacrifices and spiritual and, uh, and intercessions and prayers for others. We hopefully realize during this time uh, our role in regardless of the church being open or closed, our role in the body of Christ, um, where we offer service, what gifts of the Holy Spirit, what gifts we have to offer, and how, which part of that uh, we make up. And asking about the other members, um, edifying that body of Christ, that congregation, that assembly, and of course, building up um, that church in each of us, in each of us, in each of our homes, in our families. It starts with, our, uh, with our, us individually, and it starts in our household. Uh, and hopefully we're asking about other members, knowing that if one member suffers, uh, all of us suffers. It's truly a living organism. And then when the church doors are open, hopefully um, we make more use of, of this liturgy of the church building itself, knowing these different meanings of the church itself. Um, during this time, hopefully we'll join, uh, as we see in St. Mary in the field decay of the midnight praise, uh, joining her and saying, uh, O Lord, open unto us the gates of the church. Glory be to God, and